Hey guys, quick announcement. So I'm hoping you'll be very excited about this. The Suzanne Venker show is now going to drop three episodes per week. In addition to the main one that gets dropped on Sundays, for those of you who are regular followers, you probably know that where there's going to be two additional ones on Tuesdays and Thursdays, shorter versions, real quick ones. But, um, There's just too much that I want to cover that I can't cover once a week. And I also want to do, um, have a few, have fewer guests on as well. I'm still going to have guests on periodically, but you'll be hearing mostly from me going forward. So, um, I recommend subscribing to the show. So you get notifications with the topic of the day, each time a new episode has dropped. And also please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. So you get free books and an early release of each episode episode. Plus, those who sign up at the $10 level get a 100% free digital copy of my brand new book, How to Get Hitched and Stay Hitched. You can do all of this at SuzanneBanker.com forward slash podcast. And now on with the show. From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. So there was a big spread in the Wall Street Journal on September 27th in their annual or biannual Women in the Workplace series, which I... I see because we subscribe to the Wall Street Journal, so I can't help but read all of this. And there's always several articles in one, uh, you know, spread. And the one that caught my eye was on the back page. It was entitled How to Balance Housework. And you might remember last week when I discussed the article in the publication Jezebel about women having, about the suggestion that women divorce their husbands this fall, all because of this whole concept of men and housework. I mean, that's, that was basically the gist of it. And articles like these are a perfect example of why I have this podcast, for one thing, and really the basis of everything I write in my books. And my, my most recent book, How to Get Hitched and Stay Hitched, I open up with a chapter called Live an Examined Life. And essentially what that means is that you have to tune out the voices and visuals in your midst Tune out this kind of crap that comes, that's fed to you all every day in some form or another, and be a hundred percent confident in your choices so that you're not inadvertently influenced by this messaging. See, if it was just one thing, you know, every once in a while, it, it wouldn't hurt you. I mean, not hurt you. It wouldn't influence you really. It's the constant drumbeat everywhere you go. And it happens in the most innocuous places, namely the media, obviously, or in Um, storylines that you read about or watch on TV. And it's not just a matter, you can't avoid it by just not reading certain publications because of this. There's just no way to avoid the narrative. So with that in in mind, I want to talk about this bogus concept of equal partner or 50-50 marriages, at least in the way it's defined by those in power, where the idea is for men and women to become interchangeable beings, where they split the breadwinning child care and household duties right down the middle which makes zero sense because it does not take into account the natural proclivities of women and men. So let me start by reading from this, this article in the Wall Street Journal. It opens up talking about a woman named Sarah who was feeling quote, so overwhelmed with everything. So she decided to type it all up. The fundraising professional and mom of one created a spreadsheet and entered every chore she could think of taking out the trash making her daughter's bottles, replacing empty paper towel rolls. She marked who was doing what, color coding as she went. Uh, Green for frequently, red for rarely, and created a separate column to denote how time-consuming the task was. When the list was done, by her tally, she had 22 items marked green and her husband had 14. Quote, it was validating, says the 34-year-old who lives outside Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. Comparing who does what in a marriage, playing tit for tat, will kill the marriage. 
There's a completely different way to approach childcare and housework. Raising a family requires countless tasks that make it very difficult for one person to do alone. And ask any single parent and they'll tell you they, it, the work never stops, obviously, because it's all on them. If there's respect in the marriage, it shouldn't make any difference who's performing which task. And that includes who's earning more money or working more, who's spending more time with the kids, who's doing more laundry and cooking, and so forth. Moreover, how much work husbands and wives do on the home front depends on several factors, such as which spouse is home more often. Whoever's home more is obviously going to do more of the work at home. Then there's the matter of whether or not the parent has a job versus a career, because a job you can walk away from after five o'clock very easily, but a career you cannot. The pressures on anyone who pursues a demanding career are great. And that's what makes taking on all these responsibilities at homes simultaneously so damn difficult. If two people in a marriage are trying to pursue demanding careers alongside raising children, the opportunity for conflict escalates. Obviously, the marriage has the potential to become a war zone because the roles are not clearly spelled out. Instead, there's constant negotiation. And this takes over your marriage. And of course, it spills over to other areas of your marriage because if you're constantly negotiating and fighting, you're not having great sex. You're not relaxed. You're not enjoying one another. You're just basically fighting all the time. And here's the other piece of it. And they're going to get into this in the, in the uh, article. It is women who take on the mental load of motherhood. That's a fact. Now, keep in mind, this, this article is all about the fact that women do more on the home front than men do and that the pandemic widened the chore gap, quote unquote, chore gap for some couples. Okay. So then um, she, there's another person they met. They mentioned three women total. The second one is this Carrie O'Keefe who ramped up her work hours last November and um, that, you know, she's trying to, to divvy up the tasks like this other gal, Sarah, with her husband, but she says she still feels the mental load of the household weighing her down and distracting her. Now, I don't know how much you guys have read on this subject, but I've, I, if it's out there, I've read it. And I can tell you that the theme is always the same, which is this. This is, this is the theme, that women take on the mental work of motherhood, the mental load. And the suggestion is that it is not fair, not suggestion, the statement, the outright claim is that this just is not fair and men need to do this same thing in order to have equality. And then women would all of a sudden magically be freed up and there would never be any conflict again and, and couples could make this work. I mean, that's, that's the clear implication. So the suggestion is that it's men's fault or society's fault and that the fact that women take this mental load on is a socially driven, you know, it's a social construct. That isn't true. That's demonstrably false. It is a biological fact that women are more in tune to the details of running a home and to childcare. They simply care more and are more invested in the details of running a home and the details of raising children. So a perfect example is this other article, I'm sorry, this other woman, the third woman named Felicia that they mention in here, who... Um, she and her fiance, uh, you know, same, same deal, trying to share the household tasks, both, both work full time. I was falling into the well. He didn't do it the way I'm used to, says Miss Gonzalez. Then her husband or fiance says that it felt like her standards were too high. If I can't do it right, I'm not going to do it. He says he sometimes found himself thinking. This is a perfect example of what I mean. This woman's husband wasn't folding the laundry the way she wanted it done. This stuff goes on all the time in households across America. And it's a perfect example of what I mean by women being so in tune to the details of how they want things done in the home. Because that nest nesting instinct and how to do it is in them in a way it is not in men. Going back to Carrie, the other woman... She acknowledges her husband was doing, I mean, sorry, her husband acknowledged that his wife was doing the brunt of the household tasks. And so he, then she says, he would ask, what can I do? And she responds, I was like, what can you do? How can you not see? How do you not know? Why do I have to be your manager? 
says the Sacramento marketing professional. Okay. Another great example. You want men to want what you want. You want your husband to fold the laundry the way you fold it, do the children's hair or the yeah, hair or clothing the way you do it to hone in on those details that they just don't care about. And you can't legislate desire in any way. So, so there's no way to fix this socially by pretending or trying to attempt to have a man think like a woman essentially is what you're asking. Cause it's never going to happen. Hence you have all this conflict in your marriage and it's never ending conflict because you can't fix it. Couples who divvy up the household and breadwinning tasks by having each person primarily in charge of a particular domain, which doesn't mean there's never any overlap, but just that you're primarily responsible for one thing. Don't tend to keep score. Thus they have fewer conflicts. The truth is, unless you've married a Neanderthal, which I'm sorry, but they have, they're very few and far between. Equality has very little to do with what happens to the nights and weekends in a dual income family. The reason for the ripple effect is time. Time. If two people are trying to raise children, bring home a paycheck, take out the trash, pay the bills, mow the lawn, paint the shutters, fix the faucet, cook the meals, clean the dishes, go to Target, do the laundry, pick up and the dry cleaning, go to Home Depot, shop for clothes, go to the doctor, return phone calls, do the grocery shopping, go to the gym, and drive their kids all over God's creation, they're going to be an overload. No matter how well parents plan this time, no matter who's supposed to be in charge of what, it will rarely run smoothly. And one person always ends up doing more than the other. That's what it means to live that kind of life. So the problem isn't the man or the woman. The problem is that it's not doable. The enemy is time. All of which is to say, when you read junk like this in the media, you have to put it in context. Give it some air and some perspective. Never take it at face value. Now, I'm sure those of you who listen to this podcast already do that because you're so smart that that's why you're listening to this podcast, right? You don't think the way the culture does, so that's why you're here. But the opportunity to pass this on to your kids or even to your neighbors and to your friends and family members when the situation calls for it is big. You need to take that opportunity. If stuff like this comes up in conversation, correct people. Like if this article were to come up, for example, and you're at a dinner conversation, tell them the truth because you know the truth. And if the people who know the truth don't tell the truth, then the propaganda will spread and do its thing. Which, of course, it already is. But you'll feel much better not getting swept up in it if you tell people what you know. And that ends this hour of The Suzanne Venker Show. Before you leave us, I'd appreciate it if you'd take one minute to give us a review at Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use. If you've done that already, or if you can't leave a review on your podcast player for some reason, please consider sharing the show with a friend or a family member. Word of mouth is the primary way we get the word out about The Suzanne Venker Show. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.